you. Thanks a lot for joining me today for this interview about some of the most fascinating sites on the planet, really. Um, just to start with a bit of background, you've sort of covered anything and everything to do with megalithic sites. So you've got the website Megalithomania, you do tours, you do speaking engagements, um, you've written a book, you've released a DVD about it. What really got you into this study about megalithic sites around the world? Uh, it really it really came through the study of crop circles, strangely. I was very fascinated by this incredible modern phenomena happening in the fields um, around Wiltshire and other places in England, but also in my home town area near Cambridge. That kind of drew me into the ancient landscape. Uh, it got me, it really drew me into this whole idea of earth energies and these ley lines and all this mystical stuff with the landscape. So I came in from quite an unusual perspective, but Soon after, I suddenly realized all these crop circles were near megalithic sites. And I started becoming really interested in these because they were full of geometry. They had all these strange energies um, and, and all these other anomalies associated with them, which kind of really grabbed my attention. Uh, and within months, I was a, a pure megalithomaniac and uh, started becoming utterly obsessed with them and started researching it very thoroughly. I, st I started meeting all the, the right people who were into this stuff. And, um, and eventually, you know, I, um, I founded the Megalithomania conferences just through uh, the, the, just because of the passion we had. Um, and it's very inspired by John Michel, I must admit, who's passed away, unfortunately. He was the big inspiration for us for Megalithomania. He wrote the book called Megalithomania back in 1982. Uh, but I found it with John Martin and Gareth Mills and... Um, and it's really, we, we, we wanted to create, because there was nothing really going on like that in England, so we wanted to create an open platform for megalithic researchers to, to come on the stage and share their insights, their research, whether they're academics or whether they were independent researchers. We really didn't mind. We wanted to kind of, you know, have an open forum, really, and debate things and make it interesting. And we come from a very antiquarian point of view, which is much more to do with just a passion for the subject rather than having academic qualifications because some of us have studied all this kind of stuff but we find there is a limit to it that it's quite rigid and it can be kind of narrow-minded in, in various different ways and we didn't we didn't want to have that as a focus so um we kind of you know we call ourselves antiquarians and megalithomaniacs really Mm -hmm. Great. And one of the places that you've written about quite extensively is Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Um, could you just explain a bit of back background about this place and its features and what makes it so special? Sure. Uh, Gobekli Tepe in southeast Turkey is near uh, San Liurfa, originally called Urfa, uh, in the, which is the sort of birthplace of Abraham uh, in the Kurdish area of, of southeast Turkey. And it's basically uh, a large hill was kind of excavated and, and, and sort of these uh, artifacts were found there back in the 60s. Um, and they looked, people thought they were Byzantium artifacts originally, but when they started digging it up and eventually Klaus Schmidt got involved, German archaeologist, they quickly found that it was a very important, very ancient site and it had been deliberately covered up by hundreds if not thousands of tons of earth. It, all, it almost like being, before it, was covered up. They'd rebuilt it, put it back to how it used to be, and then covered it up. It's almost like a time capsule. There's multiple levels there. There's mounds upon mounds, and there's stone circles upon stone circles. There's 20 to 30 of these stone arrangements with these T-shaped pillars, these beautiful intricate carvings on them, which really shouldn't exist because the dating of it is, is the most remarkable thing about it really because it goes back at least to 10,000 BC. Some people even say 12,000 BC is the very earliest stage which puts it out of context with everything. It, it's, you know, seven or six or seven thousand years older than the pyramids and Stonehenge. So even when they were being built, you can imagine Gobekli Tepe was an extremely ancient site that had been covered up thousands of years before. Um, the, the reports from Klaus Schmidt and Andrew Collins and other researchers suggest that it was used for maybe two, maybe three thousand years as a site, as a ceremonial site, or whatever they were using it for. Certainly astronomical um, observations were taken from there as well. And then it got rebuilt and covered up, and no one knows really why. Um, and eventually, when it, it got discovered back in uh, really 95, when, it was when they first started excavating, it's really shaken the foundations of archaeology and all history books, really, because because of the dating, there should not be 
anyone with that kind of, I mean, the, the stone carving is so intricate, so precise, beautiful, artistic, abstract. That couldn't have existed back then, according according to the modern history books and archaeology. So it really is a game changer. It's a paradigm shift. It's something, you know, it's going to rewrite the history books. And, and it's a very early stage of excavation. Only a very small percentage has actually been um, excavated. So it's very exciting times. We're, we're delighted that we get a chance to go there um, and explore these on, on these tours we do. Mm, right. And is excavation still ongoing now? Are they still working on sort of studying this site at the moment? Yes, excavation is still happening. It's it's almost like the, the earliest, very early stages of excavation. Uh, every time you go back there, they're, they're uncovering more and more stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they, they're doing it very slowly, very precisely. These German archaeologists, they carbon dated it accurately. And so, yeah, when you go there, it's like a kind of building site, unfortunately. It's not like a beautiful kind of pristine <laughs> visitor centre. and There's nothing like that. Uh, there's a bunch of blokes hanging about with no tops on, you know, shouting at each other and drilling and things. Uh, and they're building a, a roof over it just to protect it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's amazing to see it, like, in that process. Um, but it's going to be several more years before it's a proper place to visit, like a tourist mm-hmm. site such. But, you know, they, they let they let us in. They let us go and have a look. So uh, we're very uh, grateful for that. Great. And you've made quite an interesting observation about this site, which is that it has some similarities or its art and architecture has similarities to some ancient sites in Peru. Um, could you explain a bit about what those similarities are? Well, well there's a few. There's uh, the, the most striking is the uh, relief carvings, which are basically um, – carvings that kind of pop out like in 3D. There's several different styles. There's a very high relief in, in very 3D style. Like it, There's like this sort of critter, some kind of, uh, I don't know what it is really, coming out the side of one of the T-shaped pillars, which is so beautifully done. And it, it's, you imagine they have to carve from a solid piece of rock and just leave, leave it there. One mistake, and they've got to start again. And so it's very important they get it right. And, and so there must have been hundreds, if not a thousand years of development before that. You also have the, the low reliefs or the, just the reliefs. And these are like just pop out about an inch uh, off the rock. And they have foxes and birds and snakes and other things. But what, what can we remember many years, the last six or seven years, uh, pretty, pretty regularly. Um, it's, it's one of my fascinations is Peru and Bolivia. And you can clearly, um, the same style and design, both these type of designs are clearly there, especially at a site called Silastani, which is around Lake Titicaca, but also a place called Kutimbo, which is another uh, site very similar to Silastani, and they, where they have these funerary towers, which are made of huge megalithic blocks, perfectly carved, polygonal in design as well, um, with all the same kind of of carvings, almost exactly the same. And that's what blew my mind. You could literally look at a picture of both of them, um, which I did for your Ancient Origins uh, ebook, and you can see pictures in there where they, they could be the same place. They could be the, the same carvers, the same uh, architects doing it. And so mm-hmm. can't, you, that's not just, I don't know if that's just coincidence or chance, but what it does, it makes you, it makes one question the dating of the sites in Peru. Because the, traditionally these are only you know a few thousand years old and built by the Inca or whatever, but because they're so similar to Gebekli Tepe, we now have to question really what were the dates of the sites in Peru? Because are they potentially the same age? Are they the same people? Were they travelling around the world? A lot of questions have arisen and will continue to challenge uh, the archaeologists and academics for many years to come. Um, there are other similarities. I'll just quickly mention. There's another site in Turkey called Alajahoyak and, a, and, and a Tusa, which are both near um, uh, Ankara, which is the modern capital of Turkey, where they have polygonal walls. Now, these are huge megalithic blocks, irregularly shaped, carved. They're puffy looking, almost like pillow looking. Um, and these are very unique style. People only originally thought were in Peru. I mean, Peru's famous for it. Sexy Woman, Cusco. Uh, Oyente Tambo and Machu Picchu and other sites all have this polygonal carving and yet you get exactly the same style in Turkey exactly, I mean when Gra- I was there with Graham Hancock uh, and he's you know as passionate about this stuff as I am and Andrew Collins is and we, we just couldn't believe our eyes, we were like whoa how can this be um, but un- unusually 
these are much younger sites, potentially. These are probably four, five thousand years ago rather than ten or twelve thousand years ago. But again, we're not, no one's <laughs> actually sure. Um, so there's a lot going on out there and, um, that there's a lot more little details I've been uncovering. And it really does take a visit to these places. Probably several times it's taken me to find all the carvings at Silistani. It took me four or five times to find them all. I think I found them. Because <laughs> they're, they're just dumped. They, they're kind of half the places demolished. They're just dumped in a corner. You have to lift stones up and you have to go through rubble to find stuff, you know. And so, you know, and so, so they are there. But like, um, many sites around the world they just get you know fairly neglected but fortunately they're still there so at least we can kind of make these observations mm -hmm. and is there something unique about these polygonal walls where um you know it's a certain type of construction that makes it really solid and that perhaps um the ancient people you know discovered this and um realized that this was the sensible way to build their walls yeah definitely i mean it's very very difficult way to, to build. Uh, very because you look at the size of some of these stones; it's just incredible. Some of them are, you know, the, you know, some of the smallest ones are like five to ten tons, but some of the bigger ones, like Sexy Woman in Peru, are a hundred plus tons. Wow. It's, it's, it's incredible. The ones at La Jolla in Turkey are probably up to twenty, twenty-five tons, and so even those are pretty, pretty incredible. Um, just to sort of witness and see that, and how they could have been doing it. So, there are some tests that have been done. Um, regarding earthquake proofing and they say that this kind of construction is almost like earthquake proof um, because it's so irregular there's no like order to it so it won't just sort of topple over in one direction it may be pushed in one direction but the other stone will go another direction and it'll kind of almost make it tighter <laughs> so there is something to be said for that uh, they're definitely made to last but to me they look like they're done by artists they're not done by just you know standard architects there was an artistic kind of influence at these polygonal wall sites, which is often you find with these, these relief carvings as well as an artistic element there. It's not just practical, although I think practical, you know, is part of the purpose of how they constructed them. So there's, there's certainly, um, yeah, the more, the more you go around the world, I mean, it's not, there's polygonal walls, not just in these places, the, the faces of the two other pyramids, not the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau, are polygonal granite. Um, no, no, one, no one really mentions that. You know, <laughs> there's, polyg there's polygonal walls down at, down at the Assyria on Abydos in Egypt. All on the west coast of Italy, there's hundreds of polygonal walls, huge ones, going up about 50 feet tall. And yet, no one knows who built them. There's all these strange legends of these seafaring Pelasgians, they're called. And the whole of Italy is kind of covered in them. So, uh, or the whole western coast, rather. There's even at Delphi in Greece, you find polygonal walls as well. And in Saudi Arabia. And strangely, uh, again, at the Gimpy Pyramid site up in Queensland, Australia, there's suggestions that part of that was faced in polygonal uh, stonework because they, they were moved from the, church, uh, from the pyramid site there and moved to the church uh, back in 1890. And that, when we went there recently, you can clearly see this polygonal stonework, although it's much, much smaller. It's, you could probably carry some of these stones with a few people moving them about. So there's certainly a worldwide um, connection there, not just Turkey and Peru. Yeah, and if you were to map all the places where these, you know, polygonal walls were found, um, I don't know if you've done that or not yet, but do, do you think there's something that links all these places together, some connection between the countries or the cultures? Um, yes, yeah, certainly. If you're looking at it from a geodetic perspective, i.e. the relationship and space, uh, space between certain sites, there are, you know, with if you, this is my a lot of the research in my book, Earth Grids: The Secret Patterns of Gaia's Sacred Science. I cover a lot of this. And Gebekli Tepe is in there, incidentally. Um, but if you, if Giza is the prime meridian uh, of the planet, if you take the prime meridian and you put it through Giza rather than Greenwich, many of these sites fall into like a, a quite a neat pattern around the world, uh, based upon um, certain number systems, uh, harmonic number systems. Um, which is a whole other sort of discussion, really. But uh, but it's only when Giza becomes the prime meridian does this function. And there's evidence, incidentally, that even at Giza, there's a much much older um, site there that was like part of a mound system there. Um, so it could even go back to the era of Gobekli Tepe. We're not sure yet, but uh, the legends certainly state it goes back tens of thousands of years. And so there are there are connections. 
that when you start looking at the numbers. And uh, I'm starting to look at the um, what, what I'm going to start doing when I start traveling to these sites again is actually m literally measure each stunt. I'm going to just take a random selection, get, take a measuring tape and actually measure it because so often, you know, there's a purpose behind this. They, they, they encode knowledge into sites and it may be through the, the sort of language of number and geometry rather than what we think of as language. And so they're not only doing that on a global scale with the harmonic distances between sites, leaving clues there, they're also doing it within the sites. Uh, this is where it starts getting kind of crazy and interesting and um, something I, I do cover somewhat in my Earth Grids book, but uh, more research is in process as we speak. It's interesting what you say about the measurements. There is another um, in independent researcher, I'm not sure if you've read any of his work, Derek Cunningham, who talks about um, the different angles, that, that the angles of the stones or the carvings on the stones are like a type of language and there's a, there's a consistency in the angles that are used, um, often relating to sort of cosmological features and things like that, which is quite interesting. Well, I've not, I've not actually heard of his work, but that, that does make sense to me. I mean, especially if you look at these polygonal walls, you, you can imagine, you know, was there a deliberate design uh, with the angles, with the measurements, with the sizes? Um, and even, you know, you, you have to question how they not only, you know, what's encoded within them, um, but also how they possibly cut and moved them. I mean, um, there's so many aspects uh, to just, uh, you know, you, you might, anyone, any person who's not really clued up might just look at this stone wall and go, oh, that's nice. Yeah, <laughs> ancient stuff, whatever, you know, walk off. But, you know, you actually just question, well, actually, how do you do that? It's like a whole different world opens up. And this is, this is much the same as like how I got into all this through the crop circle. I was asking the same questions about the crop circles. How do they do that? What, what's this geometry telling me? What are these numbers telling me? Um, stone circles in England have number codes, uh, metrology, uh, ancient measure, they have geometry, they have certain um, clues you know, encoded within them. Uh, and even like one, one of the most interesting things is what some people refer to as archaeocryptography by people like Karl Monk, is that within the site itself, if you know how to read the site, you can actually work out exactly where you are on the planet. Uh, it's like almost encodes its own GPS. Uh, this is something I cover in my book as well. Um, and this is something I'm looking more and more into because it's like these are like what, they, what are called naval sites or, or omphalae or axis mundi sites where they're marking a particular spot on the planet for a purpose, possibly a great survey, possibly um, it was to do with harnessing the energies. It could be multiple other purposes. But there's a lot more to it than meets eyes. I believe the ancient language before writing came in was uh, number, uh, mathematics, and geometry, which is the <laughs> universal universal uh, system, which is timeless, is everywhere, it can be used, utilized anywhere in the universe, and can be understood by any one, any type of being that's intelligent enough to work it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems like we're only just scratching the surf surface of that knowledge and you know what they knew about all of that yeah yeah for sure and i mean i mean just look there's this classic thing with the great pyramid isn't there where they've kind of decoded it and looked at all the numbers they saw prophecies built within it and all this kind of stuff but what i think they were you know misunderstood is the fact that um the only way you can send a message through time over many thousands of years is through number and geometry because languages get lost. We can't understand the hieroglyphics properly. We can't understand the Sumerian writing properly. We can't do this, that, and that. It all gets lost and we don't understand it. Or if it's not written down in stone or in tablets, it's gone. Mm -hmm. But if you're actually encoding that knowledge into the site itself when you're building it, then that's it. You kind of, you know, you've got it. It's all there for the taking. Uh, this is why I think um, Gobekli Tepe, for instance, was actually covered up. I think it was. It had to be actually put back in place exactly as it should have been, its original construction. Because it was like probably the gods who built it. So, um, so they had to keep it in the right place because that's that's where the meaning is. That's where the knowledge or the wisdom or the messages are. If it's being destroyed or anything or moved out of place, it ain't, ain't going to happen. And so I find that particularly interesting. Um, and it's another angle to look at any sites from really. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. And just going back to that similarity between Gobekli Tepe and uh, and Peru, um, is do you have any theories about how this happened and what links uh, these two places together? They're obviously separated by about 12,000 kilometres. So um, do you think, <laughs> you know, that one culture visited the other and influenced them or what's your perspective? Yeah. There is actually some hard evidence of that that certainly was the case. There's something called the Fuente Magna Bowl, which was actually discovered near Tiwanaku uh, in Bolivia uh, earlier last century. Uh, and it was only 60 years after it was discovered that it was actually looked at by archaeologists. And it actually has proto-Sumerian script uh, on it. You know, it's been sort of painted on it. It's about, you know, it's about this wide, it's about three, three feet wide, four feet wide. And it's, it shows proto-Sumerian script, another type of Sumerian script, and the Amara, ancient Peruvian, Bolivian language. It's almost, it's almost like the Rosetta Stone of South America, really. That's, that's the way it's being uh, put out there. And it's now on, it's now on display at the, uh, La Paz Music, Gold, Gold Museum, which is actually usually closed, so you can barely ever see it. And there's also the, uh, the Pochita monolith as well, which has a similar carving, which is like a, a stone statue, similar carving. So that clearly, clearly shows that there was from the Sumerian kind of Turkey, um, you know, cradle, you know, the cradle of civilization area, there was a direct connection with that part of Peru and Bolivia. Um, and, and the pros, they dated the writing and found that it's, it's about 3,500 BC. So whatever, you know, whether there was anything before that, going back into the era of Gobekli Tepe, or whether this was just what, you know, just one example of one of the times they went over there. It seems like this is pretty much the only kind of solid evidence of that. It's been dismissed, it's been ridiculed, it's been ignored. That's when it's worth looking at it. <laughs> because that's, <laughs> yes. that's where the best stuff comes out from. Um, and like David Hatcher Childress has done a really good analysis of it in his World Explorers magazine and in, in his book about uh, ancient technology of Peru and Bolivia. I mention it um, in an article I've written recently, and also um, I think that really is the smoking gun. I mean, you can't deny there's a connection there. But also, if you look at the language and and the, the symbols, there's a lot of similarities between the two areas. Uh, whether there's a connection back 10,000 BC, I'm really not sure. That's still in the process of unfoldment. However, there's one extra little clue is the fact that they found um, squash seeds and various evidence of agriculture uh, in the highlands of Peru uh, going back to 8,000 BC, 8, BC or 10,000 years ago. And so the same kind of style of agriculture was happening at the same time or just before in the area around Gobekli Tepe or the Fertile Crescent. And so there were little clues popping up but they're very vague, they're very ambiguous but as time goes by, we should get more more information coming through. Mm -hmm. And and what about the text on that bowl? Have they actually deciphered what it says? Yes, they have actually. Yes, very 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 interesting. I, I do recommend people look this up um, on the internet. It's, it's, or look at David's book. Uh, I can't I can't remember it all, obviously, but it, it's almost like incantations to the to the goddess, different gods, uh, to the land, things like this. It's very kind of almost like a spiritual kind of way uh, the way it's been interpreted anyway um and, and it's very beautiful in fact I, I was quite mm. surprised i thought it was going to be kind of um you know something else but it's it does seem like they they're exclaiming they come from a different land and they're on this land and they're making offerings and they're giving out things to the goddess and other such things so it's like a more uh it could be the way they were kind of it was one of the traditions which you get in different parts of the world of you know of um you know, invoking different gods and goddesses to keep the land fertile, to keep things growing and making offerings and things like this. So it's kind of got that element to it. Um, yeah. but it's fascinating. So it's probably used for a religious purpose or ceremony. Potentially, yeah, but it's, it's just like that we don't know, that, you know, it's hard to know the mindset of, of like who these people were. Maybe that was just the way it was for them. It mm -hmm. could have just been their way of speaking and thinking and living. We just don't know. But yeah, it does seem like that. But there's, there's something in it, there's, there's something else going on there, uh, which we maybe haven't. There's probably a sort of underlying kind of language there we haven't quite grasped, which is, uh, again, um, you know, hopefully we'll find out more as time goes by and there'll be more discoveries to back this up. Yeah. And you mentioned it's been called like the Rosetta Stone of South America. Does the, um, the indigenous script, Aymara script, 
say the same thing as what the Proto-Sumerian script says or have they been translated to say be saying different things? I think it's pretty much the same. I've only seen one translation, so I think it's the same. I mean, when they first when it was first discovered, no one had a clue. Um, it was Sumerian. They thought it was um, just a weird local dialect, and, and, that, and that was that. But it was only when someone who kind of knew what he was doing looked at it and said, that looks a bit different, and he checked his records and started comparing it. Um, and so, yeah, so it's just, it's just delightful and, and wonderful that that's actually there, and, uh, and it actually shows some evidence of that. And you look at the stone construction at Tiwanaku, where near, this was found relatively near there, uh, and then you look at Quebec, Tepe, they are kind of similar. There's similarities there. Um, you can't, you know, there's just certainly something going on there. But it's just the, the potential different in, difference in age between them is quite could be quite significant. Although mm -hmm. no one really knows because there's, there's been evidence, archaeoastronomical evidence, um, worked out at Tiwanaku, which suggests it's 17,000 years old, according to Arthur Poznanski, but you know, back many years ago. Uh, but that's been kind of partly discredited, partly brought a bit closer back to, you know, a few thousand years um, earlier. So who knows? You know, there's, um, there's a mystery there to be solved. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully with uh, a lot more work going on at Gobekli Tepe, they might start unravelling a lot more about this, this place. No, for sure. I mean, I, I can't see... Um, I, I really think there's, there's big discoveries yet to be made. I really do, mm -hmm. I think. They, they have unearthed uh, potentially, you know, it may not even be the oldest one, but I think from their ground penetrating radar, they've actually um, noticed that um, what they, they had part of the abduct up is one of the earliest parts because they built mounds kind of over the top of the, these stone circles and then built another stone circle on top. <laughs> but they've managed to get to the, one of the earliest phases already. But I'm sure more things are going to be discovered. There's only a, a small percent has been uncovered, a very small yeah, wow. So you're, you you um, run multiple tours to a lot of these different sites, including Gobekli Tepe and to Peru. Do you want to explain a bit about the tours that are coming up next? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, uh, we, uh, we've been running the conference for years and we had a lot of interest and in almost like harassment from the megalithomaniac saying, well, well, take us to these places, please. So we kind of did. We started doing that now. And I've collaborated with Andrew Collins, who's, who's like really the foremost expert on El Gobekli Tepe. He's got a new book coming out in May, entirely focused on it. It's going to have everything you need to know about it in that book. Highly recommend uh, reading any of his research. Really. So we're collaborating we, and we've invited Brian Forrester over from Peru uh, to give us his insights and, sim and the similarities and styles and things like this um, to give it a bit of a different angle. Um, and we're doing that, what is that, May the 26th to like June the 5th. We do a comprehensive tour many different sites, Chattel Hoyak, um, we go to the big underground um, cities in Jerome, uh, Cappadocia, places like this, Haran, the astronomical tower. Uh, so there's a lot of sites. We've got to go back to Tepe twice just to make sure because, um, you, know, you know, you may only go there once in your life. You want to see it more than once just in case, you know, something happens. Um, and, yeah, and then... We've got, and then we're doing a few other things. We're going to Wales. We're doing a trip around megalithic Wales and Anglesey in June. Then we, with Andrew Collins again, we've um, we've collaborated with uh, a group of excellent um, friends, Glenn and Cameron Brown, who run tours. And we're doing one. We're going to be basically tracking the St Michael line across England in, in July, July 12th to the 22nd. And going to Avebury, private access to Stonehenge and other things, many other sites all the way down to Cornwall, because we're kind of obsessed in England with the St. Michael line. I don't know if you know about this, but all everyone's, anyone who lives in southern England is into earth mysteries, can't get enough of it. Um, and then uh, we will be going with Brian um, to Peru in November as well. So we've got quite a few things going on. Plus, we're going to Italy, looking at the polygonal walls and set up. We've got a lot. Yeah, people just check out megalithomania.co.uk. It's a bunch of stuff um, people can take a look at. We're having a break from the conference this year. Just, we just need a kind of break. I think it, it needs a break. We've been doing it for like nine years now, and it's getting a bit much. People want to just oh, have, have a break, go and see <laughs> some sites, and then we'll come back strong next year. So um, yeah. that, that's the way. That's the way we're doing it. Well, you're really uh, covering the globe with those tours, so it seems like you've got a, enough on your plate with those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite. 
point. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Hugh, thank you very much for your time. That was really fascinating and um, it's great that you've got the tours going. So anyone who wants to really experience these things firsthand, as you said, you've really got to sort of see it to believe it and to understand the scale of it. Um, you know, they, they can go there um, on yeah. a tour. So that's, yeah, for sure. I, I mean, one other thing, I mean, we do, one of the things I forgot to mention, we do actually have enough time we spend enough time to people really get into the energy of the site and we do dowsing as well for the, oh, i'm very i'm very into dowsing uh the old geomantic kind of um tradition and so we do apply that there because some people you know you can actually find out where these energies are and you can actually kind of go stand in them and get buzzed up and things like this so um you know there's multiple different reasons to visit these places sure. excellent okay well thanks again for your time Thank you very much, April. Appreciate it.